Hi everybody and welcome to the last Thursday of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Before I start, I want to wish luck to all of the first years and all the Hogwarts students who are boarding the Hogwarts Express today and heading off to their first day at Hogwarts. In honor of the last week of the first book, I'm going to do a sort of character analysis on Harry, like the one I did about Hermione before. I know my dad and Karina already touched on his bravery and his heroism, but what I really want to touch on is how loyal he is and how much he values his friendships. Honestly, not every friend is going to help you get rid of your illegal dragon. But really, I'm kind of surprised that Harry wasn't considered higher for Hufflepuff than Slytherin. I mean, that loyalty, that dependability, that quality that the Hufflepuffs have, Harry has very deeply ingrained in him. Of course, sometimes, not really in this book, but he likes to play the martyr. He says, oh, I'm the hero, I'm so tried, and my life is so hard, everyone doesn't know what I'm going through. But then he comes through fantastically, and he always saves the day, and... He's just an overall good person, I think. Unfortunately, being a really good person lends itself to certain naiveties, and I'm thinking in particular of when he goes through the trap door and he's facing all of these tasks. They all are perfectly suited to his skills, his friends' skill sets and everything. When I first read through these books, I thought, that's kind of lame. I mean, really, they set up these tasks specifically to Harry and Hermione and Ron's skills, and it's sort of like cheating, but then all the stuff that happens and is said with Quirrell and Voldemort down in the chamber, I think Dumbledore knew exactly what he was doing. He meant for all of those to be easy for Harry to get through, and Harry was faced with the gravity of the situation that Voldemort really was trying to come back. Voldemort truly did hate him and want to kill him. And if it really was all a plan by Dumbledore, I think he's lucky that Harry was as competent and as intelligent as he was to get through all of those things and figure everything out and not get himself killed. Alright, now sort of moving on, but not really. Back to the centaurs in the Forbidden Forest, they were talking a lot about the things that were to come and what humans must not know. I really want to know what the centaurs know, if they knew about the Sorcerer's Stone and what they knew was going to happen in there, what they know that's going to happen in the future, because of course more catastrophes like this are going to rise as we get further into the series. So my question for this video is how much do the centaurs actually know? Do they know everything that's going to happen? Do they know it all to a science? Is it they know exactly what's going to happen, or they have a vague idea of what could happen given the right circumstances. Dumbledore as a character really starts to make more sense here in this last chapter after he saves Harry and he's talking with him in the hospital wing. You realize that this name of Dumbledore actually has a person, a, a kind, thinking, genius person behind it. But even through all that kindness, I feel sort of conniving, well no, conniving might not be the right word, more of calculating intelligence. As things unfold in the last couple chapters, you get the sense that Dumbledore orchestrated this whole thing just to get Harry that face-to-face -face with Voldemort. Dumbledore, I feel like, seems to think that he knows best about everything. Everything for Harry, he knows what's best for him. And maybe his vision is a little skewed sometimes. I mean, I don't know if coming face-to-face -face with the person who tried to kill you, murdered your parents, would be the best thing for an 11 year old boy, but... So this leads me to responding to one of my mom's thoughts about Dumbledore and his foresight. When I heard her say that, it really hit me. Dumbledore seems to have this master plan, and I've always been saying J.K. Rowling has this master plan. I almost feel that Dumbledore and J.K. Rowling are sort of the same person. They have an idea for where the story is going, and they're going to make it happen. J.K. Rowling doing it through Dumbledore, Dumbledore doing it through whatever means he can. I really feel some sort of direct correlation from the book and outside the book, a parallel, sort of. Now I want to respond to a couple of my mom's questions, the first being she talks about Quirrell and his stutter, whether it's real or not. Now I think that the stutter is not real, but from what I gather, all of his exploits, all the things that he did, that he wrote about, that he explored doing, the zombie, the vampire, everything, I think that he actually did that. He went off, he explored, he did all these things. And then he played up this shaken, horrified professor with the stutter to make everyone be like, Oh, poor Professor Quirrell, he's had been through so many horrible experiences in his life. Let's just give him a break. A nice, quiet school experience. Which, of course, backfired as soon as he turned out to be a double-crossing traitor, backstabber, Voldemort, back-of-the-head person. Anyway. Her other question was how the Mirror of Eris had gotten to that room and whether Dumbledore planted it there for Harry to find and figure out how to work. Now, however much I've been saying how intelligent, how genius Dumbledore is, I don't think even he's that good. I don't think he 
could plant this mirror in a certain room and get Harry to sneak off and get into this room and figure out how to work this mirror. It may have been a fortunate side effect, but my real question is, where did the mirror come from originally? Not how did it get in that room, but where did it come from before that room? Because we never really hear of a magic device like that afterwards. It, it's there, and then it's not anymore. I really don't have that much more to say about these chapters. I'm going to close with one thing that I found funny. You always hear about these Quidditch matches, and it's always, oh, Gryffindor versus Slytherin, or Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw, or Gryffindor versus Hufflepuff. There are other matches, aren't there? There's, like, Ravenclaw versus Hufflepuff, or Hufflepuff versus Slytherin, but we never really hear about those. Do Harry, Ron, and Hermione not go to those matches, or are they just not important enough to talk about? I guess it's just one of those things that J.K. Rowling decided that she didn't have room to fit these matches into her upwards of 870-page books. So I guess there's not going to be a spoiler section today. I didn't really have that much to talk about from these chapters. But before I close out, I want to say thank you for watching these videos with us. Please join us next week. We're reading the first three chapters of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And I think things are going to really start kicking off. We're going to have a lot more fun as they go and we figure everything out. So check back for the next couple days this week to see Alex and Amanda's takes on these last five chapters. And join us next week for the first three chapters of the second book in the Harry Potter series. Bye.